Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Facebook Live today. Thank you to everyone joining us from all over the world. We have a very fascinating session lined up for you today. So excited about this one. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I see people are still joining. So we'll just uh, wait a couple moments before we begin. Uh, as I said, we have a fantastic session. We have with us today Jeannie Milgram, uh, and she'll be telling us all about her family history. Uh, so really looking forward to today's session. Before we jump right in, I'll just let you know about a draw that we have going on today. We'll be giving away one My Heritage DNA kit to a lucky winner in the audience. And uh, to enter in our draw today, all that you have to do is leave a comment in the comments section and, and let us know about an ethnicity that you've discovered or part of your heritage that you've uncovered uh, with my heritage that you'd like to discover more. So uh, whether you find out that you have, uh, you know, Swedish roots and now you'd like to uh, hopefully one day go and visit Sweden and go meet your ancestors or, or re long lost relatives that you have connected with there, uh, anything like that, we'd love to hear about it, uh, especially if it was a my heritage discovery. So let us know in the comments section throughout today's Facebook Live, and we'll be giving away a DNA kit to one lucky winner. Of course, if you've already taken a DNA test with MyHeritage, which we hope you have, then you can use the kit uh, for a friend, a family member. So uh, we'll we'll leave uh, we'll write that in the comments, and you can. Uh, comment throughout today's session to let us know. In addition, we do have our DNA sale going on, our Christmas DNA sale, it's still live. So we'll put a link to that in the comments section as well. Uh, so now without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker today. We have with us Jeannie Milgram. She's a genealogist, a crypto Jewish researcher. Uh, she pioneered a method to trace Jewish lineages the 1400s. Jeannie was a former president of the Society for Crypto Judaic Studies in Colorado Springs and the Jewish Genealogical Society of Greater Miami. Um, and I'm sure she will tell us more about herself and all her amazing genealogical activities that she is part of. So let me bring her onto the screen now one moment and we'll get her on here to say hello. Hello, Jeannie. How are you? Oh, yes, yeah, sure. Good morning. Uh, it's early over here on the East Coast uh, of the United States. I'm in Miami, so it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us so bright and early. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we appreciate it. We appreciate it. And I see you're not alone. I see we have a lot of, a lot of uh, viewers here from the East Coast as well. We have Wendy from New York. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, Caden from Indiana, uh, all over the world, really. Viewers from all over. That's wonderful. I'm looking forward to sharing my story. So I'm going to tell my story first. And when I'm finished, I'll give a presentation showing pictures of some of the things that I spoke about. Sure. So take it away. And when you're ready for your presentation, just uh, call out to me so I can bring them onto the screen. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. So it's a pleasure to be here today. I will tell you my personal story. And it's, um, it's a very, um, let's say it was a long journey. I was born in Havana, Cuba, to a Roman Catholic family. And the family had only been in Cuba for one generation, meaning my grandparents, who were first cousins had emigrated to Cuba in 1918. So the one generation uh, my mom, and then um, I was second generation, let's say Cuban. And uh, when Castro Revolution came in 1960, my family moved to Miami and put in the best Catholic schools. Uh, I've been in Miami most of my life and always in Catholic uh, girls school. But from a very young age, I just felt that, I, I don't know, I, I just, the whole a Catholic environment, religion, it just wasn't sitting right with me. And, and it's hard to explain because I was very young, but this is, um, this is what, you know, what it was. It just, something just didn't click. And I've always been a person very attracted to religion, but something just didn't click. But, you know, you're a kid, life goes on. I went on to a Catholic high school 
Um, and from there on, I went on to a Catholic university here in Miami, Barry University. So it was, um, I, I was always very, um, it wasn't a, a great place to be where I was uncomfortable, but my parents being Cuban Catholic and, and it was part of the, just it's what you did, right? What you did here in, in Miami. So I got married very, very young and I got married to a Cuban Catholic man and I had two children and life went on working with my dad in the family business, life went on. And then when I was about 28 years old, I just thought, I don't, I can't do this anymore. I saw that I was having a huge attraction to finding out who my ancestors were. I was having a huge attraction to, to being Jewish period. And, um, and I just said, okay, that's it. I don't understand what's going on, but it's been going on too long. And I saw that my kids were following along. I mean, I was bringing them up in a certain way. So um, unfortunately I became a single mom and I pursued my, my love of, of being Jewish in a very long five and a half year conversion. I returned to tradi traditional Judaism. So I am Orthodox. Um, I did not convert my children. I didn't feel it was correct. I'll use that terminology. I didn't feel it was ethical. I didn't feel it's something that I should do because I was having an existential crisis from the time I was very young. So it was kind of a very difficult um, way to be. And I was a convert, uh, Orthodox. Uh, I then met my husband who was from Belgium from a very, very long uh, Hasidish uh, dynasty, which uh, is basically uh, the Jews that are, um, let's say today, uh, more strict and more, um, more visibly uh, Orthodox, but he was a modern one with a strong uh, background. So we became, he moved to Miami, we uh, belonged to a synagogue, became very active, and, and I didn't think much more about my background or anything along with that because I, I was just so busy living life like we all are. But um, my grandmother, my maternal grandmother used to be telling me all the time, what you're doing is so dangerous. Uh, uh, and she was at my marriage in the synagogue to my husband and the whole time that I was in the conversion. And she was just saying, it's so dangerous. It's so dangerous what you're doing. And I thought she meant it was dangerous for my soul. But really, I think she just meant it was dangerous to be a Jew. I think this is what she was trying to portray. And at the same time, she had been teaching me a lot of customs in the kitchen. I was very close to her. Uh, we were five grandchildren and I'm the only one that she taught. She taught me a lot of the Jewish cooking customs. And I really like, didn't understand that they were Jewish to begin with. But after five and a half years of learning to get to where I was uh, in my conversion, I understood that these were really Jewish customs. So she died on a Friday morning and my mom told me she had to bury her within 18 hours. And I'm like, really? You know, that's a Cuban, that's a Jewish custom, mom. No, 18 hours, we have to bury her within 18 hours. And that just kind of clicked on me. And I said, wait, wait, something's going on. Um, I know that the families that came from Spain, they had only come to Cuba in 1918. So it wasn't like, I was staring down the barrel of a, you know, 1492, let's say. So it was kind of, I didn't know too much at the time about the Jews of, of Spain and, and, and Portugal. I just, it was something that I just really did not know too much about. Um, but when she died and my mom had to bury her within 18 hours and she was adamant, my mom wasn't crazy about the fact that I had, uh, converted out of Catholicism. And to me, I never saw it as really converting out. I always felt like it was a spiritual return, even though I did not know uh, what my ancestry was. I, I still felt for me, it was a spiritual return. So on the day my grandmother died or the next day, the day she was buried, my mom gave me a little box and I'll show you in a minute the pictures um, with um, a couple of pieces of jewelry that my grandmother 
only wanted me to have on the day she died. One was a hamsa, which is a hand of God. And the other one is these little uh, earrings with stars of David. And I'll explain a little bit more to that. And then I realized in that moment that I needed to search for this ancestry. Uh, really, it was something that it, it was one of those, oh my God, moments. Because even though I had already been practicing for uh, and, and living a very Jewish life for about 10 years. It was just one of those moments. So I contacted a genealogist in Spain. My mom had given me a family tree that my grandfather made. My grandfather and grandmother, same tree. They shared grandparents and the tree. I saw that at every single generation, going back to 1795, they were literally sharing grandparents first cousins getting married, first cousins to second cousins. And it was like, uh, it was the first time that I had really seen that. But then I began to read a little bit more and I understood that the descendants of the Jews that went into hiding in, in during the Inquisition, that they married each other to make sure that they were marrying Jews. So that part finally uh, came into play. And so this genealogist went in, you know, in the Spanish uh, records, church records, and he was just following my maternal lineage completely, just grandmother after grandmother after grandmother. I mean, just until he got to 1545. And there was a lot of circumstantial evidence. And uh, my dream was for finding that I had been born Jewish. And it wasn't so much for me because I was living a Jewish life and I didn't see how it could be different, but for my children and just because the feeling was so strong from the time I was a child, I wanted to be sure I wasn't nuts. I mean, so I don't know what was more important, my kids or me proving to myself I wasn't crazy. And anyway, we found all of these records and it really, it wasn't enough. It wasn't pointing to a Jewish person. I went to the Jewish court in Israel. I tried to, I showed everything they told me. I did an incredible work of genealogy, but they told me I needed to go back to the village of my ancestors. And I needed to find that there was a Jewish presence there because historically there wasn't any. And I also needed to uh, point directly to someone that had been killed in the inquisition. Unlike uh, regular genealogies that you can just, you know, you're Jewish and you go back and you just find your relatives on this way, you have to go through the Catholic church because there were no more cemeteries. There were no more Jewish marriage records or circumcision records. So you have to go directly back to the inquisition. So the reality is, is that eventually I did, I was able to locate in the Inquisition records of Portugal. Not all of them are online. Some had to be looked at in person. I was able to find 45 relatives directly on my maternal line that had been uh, judged in the Inquisition and burned to death at the stake. So the next thing I had to do was make like this total heritage journey into the village of my ancestors because there was nothing, nothing written. And I knew that would be harder, but off I went. My family tree, by that time, it had 8,500 or more names. All the Spanish names that you can imagine are on my tree from top to bottom. Ramirez, Menendez, Martinez, Barrios. There's not one Spanish name that's not on my tree because the names morph through the generations. A lot of people put a lot of credence in the names, but the reality and say, oh, that was a crypto Jewish name. Yeah. Most of the Spanish names, even the old Spanish names like Garcia are crypto Jewish, were used by the crypto Jews Crypto Jews were the Jews that were hiding, pretending to be Catholic. So this was my family. I was able to follow them as they went from place to place via all of the records I found, boxes and boxes and, and now flash drives and flash drives full of the heritage that I was able to find by following the genealogy and by following the records. There's, there's no other way to do this. I get hundreds of emails. Oh, I want to do this. You know, I'm, and I only know my mother's name. Well, 
it's a great place to start if you know your mother's name, because some people are adopted and that's where DNA comes in as well. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but um, there's no easier way. There is no easier way than to just go back through genealogies, go back through, try to find people that match you, that know their genealogies. My heritage is actually the perfect place to do that. The DNA and the heritage findings. So um, now there are a lot more people that have, you know, been able to locate their roots. Uh, it's not simple. Uh, nobody pretends that it's a simple uh, procedure to go back that long. Um, eventually I was able to go back to 1405 and, uh, pre-inquisition Spain and Portugal. And eventually I was able to find the Jewish names of the family. And this only, I've been at this for 20 years. This only happened, the Jewish names of the family and the rabbis in the family only happened about three months ago. So it's ongoing. Once you commit to finding this heritage, it's ongoing. And because information becomes available uh, constantly, then um, it, it can be done. I mean, my message is it can be done. So then I took everything. And in the village, I was asking about the Jewish background. Nobody knew anything. It's a tiny village. It's where my grandfather was born and my great grandfather from my grandmother. So that's, that's where the family lived for 523 years. Uh, they went across, uh, it's right near Portugal across the river. So they went back and forth and back and forth, uh, Spain, Portugal, Spain, Portugal, like all up and down the river. And so it was easier, I would say, if, if easy is a word that can be used with this, it was easier for me to, to locate this uh, because the family just hung about in the same couple of hundred miles. So eventually, after much prodding, I was able to find someone that knew where the synagogue was by oral tradition in the village of uh, Fermoseya in the Zamora region, which I'll show you in a minute uh, what it looks like. So they were, I was able to uh, find this very little inside. I, I found two ritual baths. I came back to the village a couple of times with historians because really I'm, I'm in science. I, I have never, except for my own journey, but there were so many people following me at that moment. I became very active in social media and I became uh, already many, many years, very vocal so that people would know that they could do this, would understand that this could be done because, you know, to me, what is knowledge of not to share? And it's important to be able to, to share. And, and, and now a days companies like my heritage are really, I mean, they are the utmost about sharing. Um, I had the opportunity, the pleasure and honor one day, uh, a couple of times I have visited the, my heritage, uh, headquarters in, in Israel. And I was fascinated by the fact that they have these huge screens all over the place. And when a match is made from wherever it is, from Copenhagen to down to Uruguay, wherever it is, you see the matches being made, um, almost like, like flickers of, all around you, you see when the matches are being made and you just see the amount of people that are on the phones helping people. So it, it really is companies like my heritage. And I think they're a leader in this that absolutely, um, help us that come from, let's say a black hole trying to regain our Jewish roots, uh, to be able to return. So eventually I did find, uh, tunnels that indicated I found signage. I'll show you pictures that were carved in the rocks in this village and the two ritual baths and uh, one synagogue uh, oral that was from before 1492. And I found another one that was underground. And that one that I found underground, the mayor of the village uh, had shown it to me. And the reason that they were very closed at first, it, it took me a few trips to get through this, but this mayor was the mayor 50 years prior to my having been there, very, very elderly. And he and the lady that helped me the first time, they were asking me for a code word. Uh, 
what was the name of the family? I didn't have a code word. I mean, you know, I was doing my genealogy. I had my tree printed out. I had it in my hand. I had 8,000 names. Um, I could see that in the cemetery of the village, every single name on my tree was in the cemetery. So obviously a tiny village like this, um, I then found that they had paid taxes for the Jews there in 1484. I found it nearby. You know, you also have to research in person. So I know there were Jews and my family were Jews. And then they were killed in, in Portugal at the stake. So I, I knew it, but, but getting your hands around the evidence is something else. I mean, you literally, uh, have to walk the walk and do these heritage, uh, going up and down. You can't just, you know, talk the talk and try to, you know, a lot of people that want to do this, um, they're trying to do it all online and, uh, soon we will have more inquisition records online and it will be possible to do this online for the inquisition of Spain and Portugal. And at a later date, I'll give another presentation on that. But very soon, uh, what I had to do in person, uh, we'll be able to do online. Uh, but right now you really have to like, you know, grab that bull by the horns and get in there. So, um, that code word, he kept asking me and my grandfather on that tree, he had written very tiny, they called us boyicos in Spanish. Nos decían los boyicos. And I didn't know what that meant. So when he said, what was your family name? And they kept insisting. I said, they called us boyicos. And boyico, now I know that in Ladino, it means little bread. So I, 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 no significance to, to anything I, that I knew of. My family were not bakers. Apparently at some juncture, they must have been if they were called uh, boyicos or they were called little breads for whatever reason, but that's what it was. So when I told him that, he knocked on the door of a small home that split into two when he said to them, um, there's a descendant of Tio Boyico here. There's a descendant of Uncle Boyico here. And this man has said, oh, we've been waiting a long time for you. So it's almost like a, a secret that this village had that um, the whole secret of everything came when I finally was able to re, you know, recount what my grandfather had written. I never saw this mayor again. He was quite elderly. And when I went to look for him, I didn't see him. But the house opened up under the kitchen, it looked like a dollhouse. And we went walking down the steps and in the steps, I was in the middle of a room where you could see where they had carved out, like uh, let's say a place where the Taurus would be held. And there was a little side door, it was all in rocks and there was benches around. And I realized that that beautiful edifice that I had seen the before 1492, um, didn't really have anything except a Jewish ritual bath in the basement. And this particular is where my family had to go to pray. I mean, underground with the dirt, the dank, the cockroaches. It was at that moment that I decided that it was going to be my mission, my passion to recount this story. So with all of this evidence, I went back to Israel again, sat in front of all the Jewish court again with all of my real evidence this time. And they took a couple of years. They translated everything into Hebrew. And they finally came back to me with a letter that said that I had been brought to this space in a very roundabout way, but that from that moment on, no one could question that I had been born Jewish. And everybody that was uh, my ascendants, my mom, my descendants, my children, were Jews. So this was like the opus and amazing moment. And from that moment on, I have been telling the story because what I feel this is, is that a lot of people talk in generalities of the Jews of Spain and, uh, oh, there's 200 million descendants in the world, which I'm sure there are. And, you know, people are grasping at trying to find these roots, this ancestry with their DNA, and they're, they're clawing at the rocks. I see it. They call me. They, they talk to me. They email me. People are just clawing at, at rocks trying to, to regain this. So 
it's important that people know that we, some of us survived. And I don't know if it's 200 million or a million or 10 or, but I, I know thousands of people that are looking for this ancestry. It's, it's hard to come by, but if I just leave you with anything, it's the following in all of these years that I have been working and talking and dealing with people on this topic. If you feel it strongly, it's usually true that you have this ancestry. It doesn't mean that um, you're going to have a direct maternal lineage like me. It may not mean it may be that it's a little jagged. It doesn't matter. But if you are waking up to the fact that you feel this, that this is pulling you, that, you know, there's no ulterior motive. There's not a man to marry. There's not a woman to marry. There's nothing that is ulteriorly, you're not looking for a citizenship, nothing that you just wake up and say, oh my gosh, I feel Jewish. Normally you would be correct. And I have seen this again and again in the many, many years I've been doing this. So I just suggest that you keep plugging away at this genealogy. The information on the internet changes daily. Follow up on all those DNA leads that you get. I mean, just be persistent. Write those emails in several languages. Don't just write those emails out in the language that, you know, I used to send those DNA emails out, Spanish, English, Portuguese, and French. Very, uh, very simple couple of paragraphs. I had a template. It's not that hard. You really, you make a couple of templates. You Google translate, whatever you want to say. Don't make it wordy. Don't talk about your mom and your grandmother. Don't make it wordy. Just whatever you want to say, do it in these four languages and send it out and follow up on every single DNA match. And I can almost assure you that you will find your Jewish lineage if you feel that you have one. So Esther, I'm ready for the presentation. Esther? Okay. I will start showing you here my presentation. I want to okay. show you. We're all okay. set. Awesome. All right. So I'm starting here with a map of Spain because I want to show you where my family lived for these hundreds of years. So this little red dot here, this is called Fermoselle. This is the Zamora region of Spain. It is all the way to the west. If you think of Madrid and you think of the map of Spain, it's all the way to the right. Four and a half hours by car, you go from one side to the other. And as you can see, it is right next to Portugal. I kind of blanked out Portugal over there. There is a river, which is a natural boundary that is actually running all this way. There's a river separating Spain from Portugal. And um, my family lived on the very, very, very little tip there, which is why they were going back and forth. Um, this is the Hamsa, hand of God, left to me by my grandmother. It's quite heavy. It is um, an antique, um, as antique as they get. A lot of people point out to me that these Hamsas are used by the Moors as well as by the Jews. I um, Historically, the Moors did not reach up to the region of my family. That doesn't mean it cannot be a Moorish hand. It's quite heavy. It's about two, two inches uh, big. And because my grandmother gave it to me on a box on the day of her death, I can venture to say that it was extremely important to her. And because she didn't tell me anything about our Jewish heritage, um, I think that she was letting this speak for it. The fear with epigenetics, we're learning more and more about the fear that is coming through um, genetically. Uh, someday it'll have measurability but the fear that has come down from the generations of hiding so much so that still in 1993, when my grandmother died, which is like yesterday, she still could not talk to me about this. The star David earrings inside a shell. And what is also was in the box with the Hamsa 
What is real important about, I think, the Star of David earrings is that in Spain, the image of a shell is used in almost all of the architectures of what is left. Like when you know that a church was a synagogue and you look up on top at the ends of the columns, there's shells. If you go in Toledo to the synagogue of Santa Maria, for example, all of the architecture is in shells. So shells was a Jewish architecture still seen today. And this earring was in the box that this is what she left me. And uh, of course she had an estate and whatnot, but on the day of her death that my mom should give me this. Uh, this is an aerial view of the village today. Um, it's 2.1 miles from one corner to the other. It ends at the beginning of the river separating Portugal. So when I was young, my grandfather used to talk to me a lot about the river. And he used to tell me that children, he as a child would be wading in the water as a child. That means it wasn't deep, little child's legs and seven, eight years old. And he'd be playing ball and they'd be throwing coins and diving for him. And they were like with the Portuguese children. Why do I mention this? Because this was the view in my head all of those years as my grandfather was telling me stories. He never stopped telling me stories about the village. I think without telling me, telling me about our past, he was telling me enough so that I would make my way there. I think because uh, it was a lot. I mean, all the time. So when I got to Fermoselle the first time to search for the Jewish, uh, uh, let's say uh, that I needed to find that it was Jewish, I saw this river and it was like an ocean. Like there's no way, not even by a boat. It was, you know, you couldn't canoe over even. It was huge. And I'm like, wait, 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 you know, something's not matching. Years, my grandfather, the little legs, ball to the kids. And it's like, you know, what's going on here? So um, I went into the, into the rural uh, archives and I read that in 1955, they built two dams and this thing, this, this tiny creek became this massive river that we see today. So when you read about the history of the crypto Jews and how they were climbing uh, through that river, you are not going to, it's not going to compute that uh, they couldn't be swimming across. It's not going to compute that they were making their way across with nobody seeing them. But if you know, and I only know this from oral tradition from my grandfather, if you know that he could actually walk across, then what you see today is irrelevant because we're talking about in 1918, he could walk across. So for sure in 1492, you could walk across. So just so, so you to see, these are the type of documents that I was able to regain my ancestry from. These are medieval church documents. And uh, they're mostly all like this, bound in church books. And this is how you recuperate the lineage going um, through the churches and getting uh, the baptisms and getting all the other documents. Um, in Fermoselle, this is the arched entrance to the city walls. I was able to and um, more or less find where the Jewish quarter would have been. I don't know how many families are there, but I do know that most of the families were interconnected to mine. And again, cousins marrying cousins. This is still today. This isn't like from a hundred years ago. The village still feels medieval. And uh, luckily you're able to, I mean, there's nothing modern. Luckily you're able to still go through and see markings on the walls and different things. Um, this is another view of some of the village streets. This little house here in the back. This is where my 16th grandmother lived uh, a little bit before 1545, right up these steps. And a lot of these homes that are here belong to my family on this same street. So I was able to um, pinpoint actually that she lived over there. Okay, um, so in the basement, I'll show you a better picture. So in that first synagogue, the one that was from before 1492, uh, the owner was kind enough to take me everywhere. She said there was nothing changed. Um, there was the arch, which she said was the original arch of the synagogue outside. 
Um, they only opened up to me when I used the term boyico. The, before that, there was no getting any information from any of these people that live there. Absolutely would not talk to me and absolutely denied that there were ever any Jews there. So what lo this granite spout looks hard, looks like it would be very rough, but the reality is, is that it's soft as butter. And um, this is where um, would have been in the ritual bath under that synagogue. I, in the garage, it hadn't been changed in centuries. I walked down seven steps into a rectangular room and this, uh, it's, this is about two feet across. And this is where the water would be going into the ritual bath in the basement of the synagogue. Um, the oral tradition synagogue, stairs leading underground. You can see these arches here on the side. There was like a shelf and then um, little seats on the side. These villages up and down that river, it just hasn't been discovered. I mean, people are still... Uh, not finding these things. And I'm kind of rushing up and down the river now during COVID, but in general, trying to let people understand and they call me in to find the Jewish uh, architecture and such. Um, and I'm, I'm trying to make this happen and bring it to light. And uh, there's not too many people really. You know, there's a lot of people giving conferences and talking and talking and talking to death about this, but there are very few if maybe a handful that are literally going in there trying to preserve what is actually left. Um, this is the mikvah or, or uh, ritual bath that is outside. Um, I went down and I'm standing here taking this picture. Um, ritual Jewish ritual baths are built and let's use the word in a kosher way. They have to have it, it, they have to have like a, it's done with rainwater or natural springs. So there's like a collection of water and it's got to be fresh and crystalline. So even though it looks dirty, I'm actually standing at the top and the water is fresh and crystalline and amazing. Um, and there's the steps leading down and then there is a bath. So these two, I was able to find. There's something, <coughs> a phenomenon called conversal crosses that were discovered by a professor in Salamanca and the crypto Jews use them to, to put symbols. This one is said to be on the steps of Zion. So of course they had converted and they had these crosses, but they um, would disguise them in many ways. Uh, for example, on the, in one of the chapels nearby on the left, this is the inquisition logo. And on the right, whenever the Inquisition had visited a place, they would make this kind of cross. We see it up and down. Uh, this one was painted black over there, but we see the, the cross is kind of like making a, a facsimile of the Inquisition uh, logo. Church walls up and down have this or something similar. Um, so when I went in the first time, I took pictures of everything that I could see. Again, um, in the sciences, I'm not a historian, archaeologist, or anything. I think I became one after all these years, but especially in crypto-Jewish uh, markings. Um, so I took this picture. This isn't a bad picture or a picture that I didn't know how to use my camera or I wasn't looking at the shadows properly. This is actually a picture, the best I could do on that day, because this kind of looked like Hebrew letters, but I couldn't do any better with a picture. And then I started sending a lot of these carvings around the world to biblical archaeology and to, you know, Bari Lang University, Oxford, Notre Dame, anywhere that had done uh, research on the crypto Jews, I started sending out. And an archaeologist in the north of the Galilee told me I had to go back to the village and see this at 2 p.m. because the crypto Jews would have their images made to be seen at 2 p.m. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, I was in Miami. This village is not easy to get to, fly to Madrid, rent a car, drive four and a half hours, you know, easier said than done. But at 2 p.m., this becomes a carving that the historians say is probably the most important piece that is in the village. So on the top, it has the name of God in Hebrew letters. It says yud heh vav -Hey. 
Um, it's got the cross and a sword across it. And they tell me that it is sitting on top of what is depicting and <clears throat> the 12 tribes of Israel. So this is a very important uh, piece that uh, shows us some of the Jewish heritage there. Um, another one is these crosses that had anchors at the bottom. And uh, if you look at Jewish coins from Israel, from the early, early days, the temple days, you can see that they had a lot of anchors in a circle, not the cross, but anchors in a circle. So it was almost here at the entrance of the church. You weren't allowed to have a mezuzah. So on the door jam at mezuzah height, there was another cross with a circle and an anchor, also very soft from people just touching it all the time as they entered the back of the church. Because even though we had already converted to Christianity and secretly following our Judaism underground, uh, we were still, um, as a people, we were still very marginalized. Everybody knew who we were. The priest used to put up signs so nobody would marry us. And perhaps that is also a reason why we married each other. Um, so the best part of what I found was that the 2.1 miles is covered with these tunnels. Every single house is joined to the next one by openings in the granite. And uh, unfortunately, with this COVID thing, um, I have been invited to a brand new one. And I've been I've canceled the trip twice that actually a new one of these new um, tunnels that was discovered. So every house, don't ask me how they did it. This is all in granite. Um, how did they open it to go? Sometimes you can stand and go under. Sometimes you have to go on your stomach. Uh, you can see the Roman arches. I mean, the whole fact that from one end of the village to the other end of the village, you can literally walk underground is mind boggling. And this new one that I haven't been able to, um, make my way over there, they found menorahs scratched on the walls and more signs in Hebrew lettering. So, obviously a very uh, Jewish rich history in this village. Um, I was able to, in the map of the village, kind of isolate uh, everything that we talked about and that I found, I was able to isolate that the Jews were living over here. So this is one of the most interesting things that I found. So this over here is an ancient coat of arms of the village of Fermosaye. And you can see in English letters, it says Fermosei. When you turn it upside down, the letters are in Hebrew. I mean, like all of these clues are just like hitting you in the face, right? It says Liskor, which in Hebrew, it may say something else, but it says Liskor for sure. Um, in Hebrew, it means closed. So I think that this history was doomed to remain closed until somebody showed up with that code word of Los Boyicos. Um, when my mom got sick, she got Alzheimer's, I found in her house hundreds of recipes, many from the Inquisition. And uh, it's just um, these chuletas um, from my Aunt Paulita. She was the last one that recorded them in 18, I believe this picture is from 1860 in Madrid. And they are made of, of like a French toast. And they pretended to be pork chops. While the people were pretending to be Catholics, they would take a real pork chop, they'd throw it in the fire, and they would eat these fake pork chops. So this is a like an incredible, if on YouTube, um, I did a show with Jamie Geller on this and the, the show is called pork chop. So you may want to watch it as we made these pork chops. Um, there's another one. This is, uh, very, uh, common, uh, eaten in the fast of Purim, St. Esther, instead of calling her Esther from the holiday of Purim, the crypto Jews called her Saint Esther and they would take the Yom Kippur fast and do it on Purim so the Inquisition wouldn't find them. And then they would take this big empanada that that recipe was in my family again and again and again. They would take it out to the river and they would eat it after the fast. This cake written by all the grandmothers is called Boyo Maimon or Maimonides cake. 
Um, I want to show you real quick here, just as a visual. Um, this is my family tree before 1600. Okay, so we still have to go all of these other 16, 17, 1800s. Everything that is in green are family members, men, women, children, babies put to death by fire on my direct maternal lineage. Um, and this is how at the end, uh, unfortunately, through their death, I found my life. So that's uh, where we all have to go, especially when we get these Inquisition records online. Uh, this is going to be the key, crucial key for people to be able to find their own lineages. Um, I have several books I have written. I felt that my history needed to be recorded. They're all on Amazon. My first one, they are in Spanish and English. My first one, my 15 grandmothers, talks about my journey in a lot more detail than I did today with the time constraints. Pyre to Fire talks about where a typical crypto Jewish family, how they lived, what they ate, where they went, and all that information. It's a work of fiction because I had to fill in the blanks. 85% is the work. What I found in the archival material about my own family. Recipes of my 15 grandmothers, which was actually published in Israel um, by Geffen Publishing, and how I found my 15 grandmothers. And again, they are all in English and Spanish um it's soon the 15 grandmothers was translated to yiddish and farsi so um that is it so i'm going to stop sharing here and uh that's it esther okay that was really fascinating what a uh what a Hello? story can you hear me Jeannie? Jeannie, can you hear me hello Jeannie, can you hear me I'm not sure. Can you hear me now, Jeannie? I uh, can. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> good. I'm not sure what happened there. A uh, little bit of technical difficulties, but uh, that was such a fascinating story. And I know I found it so interesting. I was just, you know, following along to hear what happened. And uh, and I see the comments here just coming in. Uh, Laurelyn says, yes, so, so fascinating. Um, just so many... Uh, so many comments here about how amazing your research has been. Cindy says you've done such great research and, and just, just the tie in of, you know, looking for your heritage and then doing the genealogical research to back it up and, and finding the answers that you're looking for. Just, just so incredible and, and really inspiring, I think, to all of us here in the audience. So thank you so much for sharing it with us. Um, we do have a couple questions from the audience that we'll take if that's okay with you. Sure. Okay, great. So uh, we have a question here from, uh, let's see, from Laurelyn, who says, does it show up in the DNA test if you have Jewish roots? Well, the yes. Yeah, the, the simple answer is yes, um, especially with my heritage. That is the only one of the companies that actually has five different uh, levels of, let's say, Jewish ancestry. It's not just going to be all lumped in because most of the people just think Ashkenaz, the people that came from Lithuania, Romania, these kinds of countries, that that's like, you know, the end all catch all. No, with uh, my heritage, you will have the uh, Ashkenaz Sephardic like mine, you'll have Mizrahi, you'll have Ethiopian. In other words, it's split in such a way that yes. Now, um, only when, I, and I had done other DNA tests, but only when I got to my heritage and um, was it that I actually, with my mom's DNA, because hers is for some reason, and, and it does change with siblings and it does change, it's not always the same. My mom came out with a 48%. And, you know, uh, Ashkenaz as well as Sephardic. I don't know where the Ashkenaz came because I have every single paper on mom's background, but I'm sure it's there somewhere. So, yes, absolutely. You will see the matches. I matched four people in Brazil, two of which before I met them had been born Catholic and returned to the Jewish people. So, you know, it does show up. <laughs> okay, uh, we have a question here from Michelle. She said, uh, so interesting. You are so very lucky. How do you find your Polish ancestry? Um, where they? How did you find where your Polish ancestry originated from? We have no records from before 1800s. Polish? 
Yeah, I guess she's looking for Polish roots. So do you have I, any I suggest on, on Polish roots, I, I suggest that you, um, you know, there's, there's very big special interest groups up there and they are as well on, you know, a lot of them, a lot of people discount Facebook as being a place that you can find a lot of this information. But whenever there is a specific group on Facebook, whether it's ancestry from Zamora or ancestry from, you know, someplace in Poland, everyone that's in that group knows everything about everything about that particular subject. They are like the, the know-it-alls. So <laughs> I see I know I've seen it. They're like, Oh my God, you don't even want to ask a question in there. But I suggest that you start looking online, Google it, special interest groups that deal with the region your family's from. And I think that then after you find all that info, you'll be able to start doing the genealogy on that. Okay. Um, we had a question also, um, just for our viewers out there, how would you recommend getting started? If you think you have crypto Jewish roots, uh, well, what are your yeah top tips or you know where do you well, the top tips the reality is is that you have to start at the beginning meaning it's so hard because the whole process seems like it's so huge so basically just start at the beginning write your name down on a piece of paper and then your mom um typical jewish lineages run maternally and that's a a religion thing i'm not going to get into that um, run your dad or run your mom, but run one at a time. In other words, work on one. If you try to work on everybody at the same time, you'll put it down, throw it away. You won't work on it. So let's say you start with your grandmother and your mother. You have to go to the church. Again, we're talking crypto Jewish. So they were in the church. They were normally not Protestants, normally not Anglicans. They were Catholic normally. Um, and you go and you get the record. The Catholic Church standardized its records with the Council of Trent in 1545. So you would literally, every record looks the same since then. It lists the name of the grandparents on both sides. So as you find each record, you go back two generations. So that is where you go. You go to the church where your mom was baptized or your grandmother was baptized and you work your way one by one, forget about, if you're doing the women, forget about the men, forget about the husbands, forget about the uncles, go straight. If you're doing your dad, forget about the women, one line at a time. Okay, and we'll just take one last question if that's okay with you. Um, sure. from Maria, she says, any suggestions for contacting long lost relatives? I've tried messaging on my heritage and also Facebook, uh, without success. So when you reach out, I'm sure you have over the past, you know, few years, reach out to relatives that you've discovered, let's say through my heritage, what are your, uh, how, how do you, uh, find success there? Okay. So let's start with many people don't want to be found. So, um, that you're not finding them is not any fault of yours. They don't want to be found. But I found um, that when I was finding and trying to get information, I wouldn't mention most of these people are not Jewish. And I don't know if you're looking from a Jewish point of view or just an in general point of view. I'm telling you from my experience, they definitely did not I, I don't, I didn't talk about anything Jewish in the, in the beginning. And when I did talk about anything Jewish, I tiptoed around it. Um, so I would normally ask, do they have a family tree? Um, what do you know? Do, what do they know about the family tiptoe if you're, cause you're talking to people that are sitting in churches. So you have to be very careful. You know, these were hidden lineages and they're hidden. Look at my grandmother. She gave me this just, 20 years ago. So tiptoe and just ask straight genealogy questions and have them engage them to tell you their story. Because when people inv are involved in this, they love to tell their story. I would do it that way. Okay. Um, so now we get the opportunity to give away a DNA kit to one lucky winner. Uh, it's always so much fun. And I love this part of our Facebook lives. Uh, we received so many amazing comments here in the comment section. Jeannie you should take a look at some of them um, afterwards, just scroll through about people that, you know, discovered different Jewish ancestry through their MyHeritage results or 
or um, other surprises that they found um, throughout their search for their family history. Uh, and now we'll announce our winner. So our winner today is um, Vitor Gustavo Cristofolini and, and Vitor wrote to us and said, uh, I have a 6% Ashkenazi Jew from the My Heritage DNA test. I still don't know which part of my family it comes from. I suspect it's from my father's side since there were Jews hidden in Trento, Italy after they were persecuted by the Catholic Church in the 1500s. So uh, very, very interesting, Vitor, and uh, we hope that you're able to narrow it down and uncover some of that path and where where it's from exactly. Uh, and congratulations on winning on my Heritage DNA test. We'll be in touch with you through private message to claim your prize. Uh, Jeannie, any tips for Vitor, who's going to be searching for his Jewish roots, perhaps? Well, I, yes, I, I wanted to give a, a tip in general to Hispanics that are trying to do this with their parents. And it's crucial. It's crucial that you get that DNA kit and get another one and do the elders. Just do the elders because that's what's most important. Important. However, Hispanic elders, I don't care what country they're from, Cuba, Mexico, they just don't trust this whole thing. So I finally, I waited and waited and waited to do my mom and dad. And I ended up, oh my gosh, I'm embarrassed to admit in an emergency room, right? Uh, because I was afraid and, and don't let it get to that. I finally was able to convince them uh, by telling them that we were looking for um, genetic uh, illnesses uh, that may have been passed down. So when you hit a Hispanic parent worried, cause that's, you know, worried for their children that you're looking for some sort of genetic issue, then they will gladly open their mouths and let you do it. So, um, that's uh, my tip if you're having trouble with your grand with your parents or grandparents. Great advice, and and definitely don't wait until it's too late. You know, um, not just with DNA testing, but also hearing those stories and interviewing those relatives. And you know, now's the time. Seize the day. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much. Esther. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. We had a lovely time, and I think this. This was such an interesting story and uh, so unlike many of the Facebook lives that we've had in the past, you know, the, a personal story is just so enlightening and we love hearing it. Um, for anyone who wants to rewatch today's session, it will be, be available on the MyHeritage Facebook page under the videos section. Uh, thank you again for joining us, Jeannie, and thank you to everyone in our audience. Uh, we'll see